So the Financial Reporting Council uh, has set up a new portal for professionals to register with the agency to facilitate and ease what you call the uh, interface between professionals such as accountants, reporting accountants, audit firms and others and companies in the marketplace. So what's the new registration or innovation all about and what actually is the Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria trying to achieve? Let's take a listen to the Executive Secretary, uh, Daniel uh, Asakuhai. In a situation where we can leverage on existing databases of um, biometric information. So presently, we are using the BVN information of registrants, or registrants use their BVN information to pick their existing information from the BVN database. Shortly, we would also provide the option for potential or intending registrants to use their national identity number. So really what you are doing is to use any of those databases, if you are already registered, to get your ex existing information, rather than going into an FROC location to physically provide that information. Now, of course, there will still be some people who would prefer not to provide BVN or NIN or don't have it. We will still welcome such people if you choose to visit our offices. But there's a, there's, there, there's a small fee for that service. I think it's now in the region of about 200,000, but it's available and, and it's your choice. But if you want to do it online, it's at no cost. Okay. So the second reason also, by eliminating this, it reduces the footprint or the amount of um, personal data of registrants that the council is holding. Okay? And then, because the name and other personal information you will have here once you put your BVN is the same, will be consistent with the information you have provided to any of those databases. So you will not, if in the banking database or in the national identity database, your name is Ado John Sule. Once you put your number in here, your name will appear as Ado John Sule and you will not be able to change it with the council. So if you need to change your name, you have to go back and, yeah? So in that way, we'll have consistencies across the um, databases. Now, the other important thing about the register, why we need to do it, is so that members of the public, when they are dealing with a professional, they can check with a government body like the FROC the status of that professional. So people, once you give your client your FROC registration number, they can come to this same website, type it in, and see your status, whether you're ideally registered professional, what professional infractions or what status you, you do have. Then the other thing embedded in here, in our current registration process, we have people essentially are registered and tied to their professional associations. Okay? But what we have done, or with the new registration system, we have different categories of professionals that are involved in the registration, in the financial reporting process. And what is the financial reporting process? It is everything that happens from when transactions are initiated in a commercial setting to when those transactions are captured in the books of account, uh, when financial statements are prepared, approved by those charged with governance, audited by professionals that provide assurance services and issued to the public. So that's the chain or the process. And there are different professionals that participate at different points. So you have people that are involved in the governance of that entire chain. So people like, for example, that are directors of companies, they approve financial statements, people that are members of um, audit committees, people that provide company secretariat services. So those professionals are involved in governance, in the governance aspects of the process. You have people that prepare financial statements or people that are involved in preparation 
So every professional that contributes to the numbers in the financial statements are involved in preparation. So key examples will be, for example, will be CFO, the chief financial officer. Other professionals could be valuers that give valuation opinion, could be lawyers that give legal opinion about pending litigation that result in numbers going into the financial statements. Then you have another category of professionals who provide assurance. Auditors, be they financial auditors or systems auditors, or you could have people who provide actual valuation, again, at an assurance level. In the preparation, you could have tax professionals, people that contribute to determining the tax numbers. And on the assurance, at the assurance stage, you could also have a tax professional. And then people whose participation as professionals is in the issuance of the finished financial statements. So when you are registering, you need to determine what type of professional am I and what stages of the financial reporting process do I get involved in and ensure you are duly registered as a professional to perform that role. Daniel Asakuhai, the Executive Secretary at the Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria. Our President uh, Buhari's administration is carrying on with his social investment programs and trying to rejig where necessary, uh, trying to take stock of what has been achieved during the administration's first term in office, now talking about the impact and what more needs to be done. So this is what our panel of, uh, of uh, experts and those who were involved uh, spoke about in Lagos yesterday, uh, trying to review this, the impact of the social investment programs and what the administration should do moving forward. Let's take a listen to some of the comments from the panel. In many ways, uh, what we did uh, in the first term, and which has been elaborated um, across the various speakers, and more importantly, uh, from the lives of the beneficiaries themselves through video and also uh, through physical presence, just really points to a direction. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, a right direction to a solution. Uh, but then, as we then stand at the corpse of a new dawn and uh, uh, you know the next level as we we'll like to speak about i think then it's it's really at a junction where we really then need to consider quite a whole lot of other things uh, and i would use that to answer to your question about expansion um, Often, once you hear expansion, everyone is beginning to think about numbers. And yes, you must do numbers because we are uh, a large country. But I think we really need to look uh, inwards and really take root. And one of the things I would love to see, and I, and I say this because you are in the technology audience, we really need to begin to map our various industrial value chains um, so that the, the, the biggest challenge you find uh, with any average youth is the identification of opportunities. So you look, you pick any sector, any sector. You mentioned a few examples, hotel and all that. What are all the possible value chains that support uh, that sector? And begin to yarn out, you know, what then are economic opportunities uh, wherein jobs are created, enterprises are created, entrepreneurship, intrapreneurship, whatever form of economic activity can be created. And then quickly, um, closely mapping to that, uh, closely related to that, is to then map the required skills uh, that are required for each of those subsets. Now that really is the connection that must happen, uh, you know, between the supply and the demand for us to have sustainable job creation, which is a question uh, that you're asking. Because if you look at it, and um, I don't know who mentioned it earlier, and I think it was a challenge that uh, the Bank of, M um, Bank of Industry MD had placed. She also said, if we had money or more money, we perhaps would have had a million people in empire, right? Not a problem, that's fine. But then the question is, the real sustainability model of the, of the empower is, how, what is the back-end absorption? 
what is the growth for the demand how is you know how how is the economy growing to be able to absorb these greater young people that we have skilled and reskilled into uh you know uh what is called a sustainable economic opportunity because i don't want to use the word job because the moment you say job everybody's thinking something else but sustainable economic opportunity that can come from whoever is doing the blogging, whoever is doing uh, the photography, whoever is doing the lighting for uh, cinematography, and all of these uh, economic opportunities. Now, because you then find that when you've identified, when you've appropriated the right skills, then it's easier to standardize. It's easier to professionalize. And then you really begin to find that I don't have to be jack of all trade, master of none. I can specialize at any point within a value chain and still live, uh, you know, comfortably, still live above, uh, greater, greater ways above uh, the poverty line. Um, so so that, and that, that's, that's really the kind of dream where we're hoping uh, that we'll achieve with the next uh, level empire. Yeah. Where a lot of people... Um, over t about 200 million people, and I think um, in 2050 we are going to be 405 million people. The largest in, yes. in Africa. Uh, and if I put that in context, and I think about the entire amount of money we spend as a country in a year, it's around 18 billion dollars. That's what our national budget is. Uh, if you look at a country like Brazil that has almost the same amount of population, the education budget in Brazil for 2018 is 24 billion dollars. Now, what it means is we spend, everything we spend as a country is just what Brazil spends on education. Um, what is clear from just that statement is we don't have enough resources, and we may not have enough resources to tackle all of the challenges that, that, is, that we found ourselves in. So what is the way out? I think in the short term, um, the reality is the education system, which is the foundation for uh, even just critical thinking. That's where you get empowered as a, as a person. From your childhood, you learn to think, you learn to be curious, and you find yourself looking for opportunities in life as decayed over a long period. And if it is decayed over a long period, what is also would happen as an evident factor would be that the graduates that will come out of it, or the people that will come out of it, may not have the appropriate skills or may not be well equipped to take the opportunities that exist within society. So I think in the short and medium, we must find uh, palliatives, interventions, investment opportunities. That means that these people wouldn't go through the same type of systems most people in other countries have been through. Or for some of us that I, I went to public school all my life, um, and I'm here, but I don't think anyone could go to the same public schools I went to and be in this situation today. I'm sure it will be an, an extreme outlier situation. Mm. So what it means in the short and medium, we must find interventions to support these people. I think in the long term, um, programs wouldn't be what would hate economic opportunities. It will be more around uh, more sustainable things. So for example, if we fix education, people will be a bit more empowered to know the right things and to, to have the right capacity to, to either identify opportunities or fit in the job that exists in society. Right. Uh, what role does technology play in Africa? Just to mm -hmm. quickly answer that. I think first of all, as a company, uh, all of our work effort is focused on things that can improve people and businesses. Uh, we've picked these four areas very deliberately. Identity, education, payment, and data. We think those four areas and our investment and our work in them will mean many more people who find opportunities for themselves, will mean many more people who could get the knowledge they need to succeed as a case. I think technology and innovation in general would drive equitable access. Just to buttress what Dr. Adekola and Hilda were saying, I think really quality education exists somewhere in Nigeria. You just can't afford it. Yes. So the real problem is how do you take this quality education and that democratize exists and democratize it? it. Yes. Technology offers an opportunity to turn the one million naira green school fees to one thousand naira per month. How do we kind of like find an opportunity to aggregate teachers to look for? You can find one good math teacher, but you can't find hundred math teacher. Yeah. But how do you get this one on, one good math teacher to teach it's millions of children? I think technology will be at the heart of opening things up. Uh, about Africa, I mean, just at the middle of the program, we've had interactions with at least three countries that have come to our office. Uh, I think the Liberian Vice President was still here a couple of months ago to come and learn specifically about what happened to this program, how was it done, what were the specifics that led to its eventual success. So I think we're actively sharing all of these successes with different African countries. As a company, we're not present yet, and our real focus first is Nigeria before we, I mean, I think you're right in that, in that, in that regard. But even though we're not present, we're offering our services in supporting their design, supporting their concept. And I think maybe Nigerians don't appreciate enough what goes on here. 
but we've seen a lot of African countries, Ghana, Liberia, just almost as they started in some, their programs as, as government, uh, came to Nigeria to try and learn, oh, what exactly happened? How did you get it done? Um, and I think in the next few years as a company, we also see ourselves at least in seven African countries uh, over the next couple of months. As, as a One of the things that, um, you know, as the Bank of Industry and as even speaking for financial institutions that do support um, SMEs. I think one of the things that we know is that access to funds or access to money is not the only problems that SMEs have. So I think by recognizing that um, we're also there to handhold them, so we're actually helping SMEs grow. If SMEs grow, um, today, the number we have for SMEs, number of SMEs in Nigeria, or number of MSMEs in Nigeria is about 37 million. And that is a lot. That is a huge number. If today we have um, 37, 38 million SMEs operating in Nigeria, you can imagine that if we're able to support even half of them, so say we're able, not Bank of Industry, but when I say we, um, the ecosystem is able to support half of those MSMEs. So we're talking about 20 million MSMEs having some sort of support that can help them not only sustain their business, but also grow their business. If we're able to create one job, so for every MSME that we're supporting, from the lowest rank to the highest, and we're saying one because some would be able to expand to take on two, to take on three, to take on four, or even ten. But let us even keep it very conservative, and we're able to create one job to every MSME that the ecosystem is able to impact. So from 37, we've gone to 20 million, and from 20 million, let us even imagine that only half of them again, half of that 20 million, we are able to sustain or grow their business. To me, that's job creation. So basically, what we would have done is we would have used the ecosystem of MSMEs to create one job, and we're looking at 5, 10 million. So that is a target that can be achieved. The other thing I'll also like to say is that you talked about technology. If we're able to bring all these SMEs onto a core platform through different programs, Again, we'll be able to harness all of them together and move them into job creation, into sustainability, and into growth. Uh, discussing President Buhari's administration, social investment programs, and part of what to be taken on board moving forward. Okay, so since 2016, the Buhari's administration has been uh, very cozy with the state governments, rolling out hundreds of billions of naira uh, steadily to support them. Uh, salaries were unpaid and the fiscal position of some of the state governments were tottering. Now the federal government itself needs money. So it's asking the state governments, 35 of them, to cough out 614 billion naira, which was arranged through the Governor's Forum and the Central Bank, and the Ministry of Finance, of course, representing the federal government uh, a few, uh, about a year or two ago, to come up with the money and repay. Now the governors seem a little bit uh, upset with that. Of course, that was part of the National Economic uh, Council meeting of yesterday, but it will be worked out. So the Ministry of Finance, the Central Bank, and the Governors Forum will sit together to work out the modalities of how to 35 state governments will repay 614 billion naira. There's no freedom anywhere, is there? 